Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for August 22nd, uh, 2022. I'm your host, Jeanette Dapheide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance to, regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. Uh, more information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is CIS controls with Trusted CI. Um, our presenters are Mark Krenz and Shane Phillips. Mark uh, serves as the Chief Cy uh, Security Analyst at Indiana University's Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, CACR for short. Uh, Mark's focus is on cybersecurity operations, research, and education. And Shane Phillips serves as Senior security engineer at the Pittsburgh Supercomputer Center, uh, and he works on all aspects of cybersecurity, and both of them are members of Trusted CI. Um, before we begin, I have a few things to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, um, guests, uh, attendees are welcome to ask questions during the presentation, but because of the flow of the presentation, we'll be taking the questions at the end. So if you have a question, type it in the chat, but we will get to it at the end. And with that, I'll hand things over to Mark. Mark, welcome. Welcome, and thank you everybody for attending and joining us this morning. Um, oh, Jeanette, do you have some community updates here? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, those that's for the end of the presentation, so we can oh, just okay. do that. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about um, the CIS controls and how uh, we did an assessment for Trusted CI, an outline of what we're going to talk about. Uh, first of all, just going over why uh, Trusted CI has a cybersecurity program. Uh, going over what the CIS controls are themselves and what a CIS assessment is, why we use version 7.1 instead of 8.0 uh, for the assessment, um, talking a little bit about the parent institution's role. Uh, many science projects have uh, parent institutions and um, we're very similar, so we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, then we'll give an overview of our results going through each of the control groups and then uh, talk a little bit about using policies where we don't have control uh, over uh, a part of the environment. So uh, Trusted CI has had a cybersecurity program for probably about five or six years now. Um, initially, it was a very small effort, I think just like 0.15 FTEs of effort. Uh, we ramped that up a bit in the, um, a couple of years ago, recognizing that you know we're a nationally recognized center of excellence, and we deal with a lot of uh, information assets, both our own and also of science projects uh, that have uh, sensitive information assets that they share with us uh, when we do engagements or uh, assessments for them. Um, so we started decking a half of FTE uh, of effort, and that split across four of us. Um, and we meet on a weekly basis and uh, have projects and milestones that we try to meet. Uh, one of that is to uh, do an assessment using the CIS control set. Um, the CIS control set is basically like a, a baseline standard uh, that you can go through to make sure that uh, you're implementing some of the industry's best practices for cybersecurity uh, and meeting a lot of the different risks that are out there. Um, this is all about you know, getting started and protecting your own assets and making sure you're covering all the, uh, the bases. So this is basically a, a benchmark for what your minimum should be, you know, what, what the minimum uh, level of security that you should be um, applying to your project. Um, and then from there, you can actually build on to that. Uh, if you're familiar with the Trusted CI framework, uh, which is available at trustedci.org slash framework, um, this is must 15 of the framework, which is choosing a, a baseline control set to go with. So anything additional to this uh, above and beyond this control set would uh, be addressed by must 16 um, additional and alternate controls. So the CIS control set has been around for a long time. Um, version 7.1 came out in 2019. And over the years has been uh, put together and crowds, you know, by information from people in the cybersecurity community. So it's been crowdsourced uh, in order to get the recommendations and the different controls. And they've made revisions throughout the years. They uh, use something called implementation groups uh, to try to help you prioritize what you should be working on first uh, before you go on to, you know, the next implementation group. Um, that way you're not, if you're, uh, pushed for time and you don't have a lot of resources, you know where to get started. 
So these are the different 20 control groups of the version 7.1. Uh, in version 8.0, they, they uh, merged a couple and pared it down to 18. Uh, but this is probably the, the 20 that people are most familiar with. They kind of call it the CIS top 20. Um, and they've divided it up into three different categories you know, for the different sets of control groups, the basic, foundational, organizational. Um, and this is a different cross-section than the implementation groups, which actually address uh, the sub-controls inside of each one of these control groups that you should actually look at. Uh, so you can see there's, there's quite a few uh, different areas of cybersecurity covered here. It should be pretty much everything. Um, but anything from doing uh, inventory control up to you know, data protection and backups, malware defenses, and up to red team exercises and penetration tests. Um, so it pretty much covers the whole gamut of cybersecurity. Uh, a, a CIS assessment is basically taking that uh, control, uh, those control groups and evaluating your own cybersecurity program against it. So kind of using the uh, sub controls as a checklist to go through and saying, are we addressing this uh, yes or no, or do we need to work on it? Um, and then the implementation groups, as I said, are a way of prioritizing, you know, uh, what you need to work on. But of course, as you go through the and check mark things that you're doing or not doing, then you'll know what you need to focus on by, you know, what is listed as not applicable or uh, unacceptable or, you know, maybe just uh, satisfactory. Um, maybe you could do it a little bit better. Uh, there's a CIS assessment tool, uh, which is a spreadsheet that Trusted CI developed based on uh, the CIS controls. Uh, that's available on the Trusted CI website uh, under uh, trustedci.org slash framework slash templates. Uh, there's a link uh, there in the bottom right hand corner that you can go to, or if you go to uh, the framework page and then under tools, uh, click on CIS control 7.1 tracking tool. So this is again, just a spreadsheet you can download and kind of helps you keep track uh, of your progress on implementing the CIS controls. You just go through one by one uh, and say, is this acceptable, not acceptable um, or not applicable? Uh, and there's a few other categories there. And then you can take notes and so on. Also making note of whether it's actually relevant to your project. It could be that it's something that's kind of irrelevant to what you're doing. Um, for instance, uh, with Trusted CI, we don't actually have, you know, we don't control our Wi-Fi. That's something that's handled by the institution. Um, or maybe if you don't have like cloud services or something like that, that might not be applicable. Uh, this can take a while to go through, you know, don't try and just do this in one sitting and you're likely to have a lot of homework as you go through it, you know, um, usually cybersecurity doesn't have all the answers so uh, you have to go off and ask other people on your team uh, for the answer to various questions as you go through it. Uh, for Trusted CI, we, we address this by going through it uh, week by week during our meetings and it took about four weeks to go through uh, the whole uh, spreadsheet. So CIS, as I said, uh, they uh, use these implementation groups and they have this iconography, uh, uh, these icons that are for the different implementation groups. And they kind of describe them as implementation group one is for small businesses, you know, implementation group two is for medium and, and IG3 is for large. I don't really like uh, the icons that they used and the, the descriptions because it kind of implies that even if you're a small business, you might not want to use IG3 but of course, you know, small businesses or small organizations can still deal with fairly sophisticated data uh, requirements. You know, for instance, if you have like a, an attorney's office or a medical practice or something like that, you, know, you probably wanna make sure that uh, you're doing everything you can to actually protect the data. So instead, I thought I'd use these stock photos to kind of represent the different uh, implementation groups. So at IG1, uh, you have like a very low baseline. It's, it's basically just like cyber hygiene stuff that you should work on. Um, and this would be the first thing that you'd go through, even if you go all the way up to IG3, you'd start with implementation group one. And this is prioritized for people with low uh, risk or low resource organizations, you know, that don't have a lot of sensitive data. 
But of course, almost every organization has some amount of sensitive data in the form of like PII for their employees or, or whatever, um, financial data and so on. And then going up to IG2, this is about, you know, as far as the number of controls that you have to implement, it's about, I don't know, three or four times more uh, controls than the IG1. Um, so you have to dedicate a lot more time uh, to implementing the controls that are listed in IG2. Uh, but this is controls that I consider most organizations should be implementing, uh, including, you know, all of you who are uh, working on science projects and, and uh, uh, trying to protect science projects probably should be looking at IG2 as like the, as the baseline that uh, level that you should get to. And then IG3 is moderate to advanced. Um, you know, you probably are going to need one FTE worth of time in cybersecurity uh, or more. That's, you know, maybe our people have a different opinion about that, but just looking through the controls, it's fairly involved, but it's about 10% more as far as controls go, as far as the count. Uh, but some of the items in there are much harder to actually implement uh, and require more time and tuning uh, than the stuff in IG2. Uh, so you are going to need more resources for that. Um, uh, like many science projects out there, Trusted CI is a consortium of um, different organizations working together. Uh, we are uh, Indiana University, uh, University of Illinois, NCSA, um, University of Wisconsin, Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center at Carnegie Mellon, uh, Berkeley, and University of South Alabama. I think I got all of them. Um, so, you know, we rely on our parent institutions to handle quite a bit. Uh, we don't try to address like network security and stuff like that from a trusted CI point of view. We rely on our parent institutions to actually implement firewalls and stuff like that. Uh, we also don't consider like our personal laptops to be assets of trusted CI. So that's something that um, where we uh, allow the universities to actually, um, you know, we pass off the responsibility for that to the universities. And as we would do that by going through the, the CIS assessment tool, we would just mark not applicable, you know, NA uh, for those controls. But it's important to actually follow up and verify with the university, uh, the different universities, that they are actually addressing those and that your assessment of your project makes sense given your relationship with your parent institution. Uh, right now, this is on our milestones to accomplish this task but it's something that I would recommend for any science project out there doing this. So uh, you may say, you know, version eight of the CIS controls have been out for, uh, I think since um, February of last year or, or early last year. Um, why didn't you just use eight since you did this, um, you know, mid in the middle of this year? And um, a few answers to that. So the first one is, you know, seven, uh, the CIS controls are already a fairly mature standard. You know, they've been around for a long time. I mean, it's version seven, right? You know, it's it's not version one or version 0 0.9 or something. It's, it's already gone through quite a few revisions. So by going through the motions of it, um, you know, we're, we're actually accomplishing quite a bit for assessing our cybersecurity program. Um, it was published, you know, still published fairly recently. I mean, two, uh, 7.1 came out in 2019. So it's not like it's 10 years old and, and missed the whole cloud thing or, or missed the whole uh, 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 ramp up of cybersecurity problems over the last 10 years or something like that. So we're still getting uh, a, a lot of the recent risks and everything um, in it. Uh, we're already familiar with 7.1. You know, we've, we've, we've done cybersecurity assessments with it uh, already, and we already had the tool ready to go for the tracking, so we didn't have to wait for like an 8.0 tool uh, to come along um, and be developed. And um, yeah, okay. And then uh, just a brief overview of our results, kind of like high level. Um, we decided to test ourselves against IG3. Uh, you know, we um, when we go back and we actually uh, implement these controls, we'll start with probably the easiest ones, you know, the IG ones and IG twos. Uh, but there's most of the ones that we didn't actually meet the standard of were IG threes. Uh, so we tested against IG three. Um, 
and we found that you know we did fairly well you know uh uh only 12 things that we needed to fix out of like 170 or something like that um and you know half of them didn't actually apply to us because they actually are handled by our host institutions so we did pretty well and uh following up on that we've created milestones for you know for the rest of the year uh to actually complete this and uh one other thing i i forgot to mention on the last slide so um, we'll do this again. You know, this won't be the last time that we do an assessment of trusted CI. And so on the next version, we'll do it based on probably version eight. Um, and, you know, so as new versions come out, you can always upgrade to the next version and, and use the uh, next version's assessment. Uh, so after we've complete all these milestones, hopefully it'll put us in good alignment for uh, CIS uh, version eight. So getting into the actual controls, and each one of these has their own slide, we'll try to go through them fairly quickly. Uh, the first one is an inventory and control of hardware assets. So this is uh, where you're actively, uh, you know, the description is actively manage inventory track and correct all hardware devices on the network so that only authorized devices are given access. And unauthorized and unmanaged, uh, unmanaged devices are found and prevent from gaining access. So for trusted CI, this was handled by our home institutions. So we put in NA for most of these, but we actually had a good discussion around each one just to make sure that there wasn't something in there that we should be handling ourselves. Um, those of you who are trying to actually address this, uh, this control should think about getting an actual asset management system, not using like a spreadsheet or something like that, but looking for an uh, asset management system that you can use to, to keep track of your assets. And then along those lines, uh, inventory and control, uh, you know, con control set two, inventory and control of software assets. So the description is actively manage inventory track and correct all soft, uh, software on the network so that only authorized software is installed and can execute and then unauthorized and unmanaged software is found and prevent from installation or execution. So this had a little bit more impact on us because we actually uh, do use some uh, custom software uh, and some uh, pieces of software uh, for various tasks. Um, but still, about half of the items were marked as not applicable because um, you know they applied to external services where we're actually not in control of the uh, cybersecurity. For instance, cloud um, secure, you know, cloud applications that we use like Google Drive, Twitter, YouTube, you know, those are part of our cybersecurity program, but we don't actually uh, do like uh, pen tests of those or, or we don't actually track the, uh, um, you know, some of the sub controls had to do with, uh, you know, providing upgrades for the software and stuff like that. Um, for the stuff that we actually do keep track of, uh, we have these documents and there's templates for these uh, available on our website under the, the framework um, uh, set of uh, pages uh, that are called, we call ASAPs, which is Asset Specific Access and Privilege Specification. Um, and those are just like Word documents. We use Google Drive for the source of them um, or Google Docs. But uh, they're basically just Word documents that uh, track and audit access and privileges. So they have like information about where we go to actually administrate uh, the software, um, how we monitor it, and who has access to it. Um, and again, uh, we publish uh, redacted versions of those ASAPs documents. So if you want to take a look at that, you just find the cybersecurity program um, uh, page on our Trusted CI website. And we have uh, the, the uh, redacted versions of our ASAPs documents, so you can take a look. Uh, we also have a software like CloudPerm, uh, which is something I wrote for doing Google Drive uh, uh, permissions auditing. And we run that on a dedicated VM with limited access, so we have to keep track of that and make sure we have an inventory uh, for that application. Um, uh, there's also issues where, um, you know, Google Drive allows add-ons, um, and so we didn't want people to be using add-ons that were unapproved, so we added that as a policy uh, item into our Google Drive policy document that said, you know, you need to use uh, supported OSs and browsers to access trusted CI assets, and also you can't use um, add-ons that are not approved by us. 
And then uh, CS3 gets into continuous vulnerability management. Um, the description here is continuously acquire, as, uh, assess, and take action on new information in order to identify vulnerabilities, remediate, and minimize the window of opportunity for attackers. So one way that we address this is by doing uh, weekly credentialed scans of our cloud VMs. Uh, we have a couple of, of virtual machines uh, they're running on um, IAS uh, services. Um, and then we review those results uh, when we get them. And notifications are sent out, you know, uh, when security updates are available to the uh, information security officers. Uh, then uh, control set four is controlled use of administrative privileges. So this is a bigger one for us. Uh, the, the description here is the processes and tools used to track, control, prevent, correct uh, the use and alignment, uh, assignment and configuration of administrative privileges on computers, networks, and applications. Um, so here we have you know, cloud applications that uh, we have access to, and there's people who have administrative access to. So we do a periodic review of accounts on external services. And then we keep track of that in our ASAPs documents. Um, where available, we use multi-factor authentication. Unfortunately, there's a few places where uh, a few services that we use that don't offer multi-factor yet. Uh, we're still trying to um, follow up with that and check on that and move to services that do offer multi-factor where it's possible. Um, and then logging access and account creation where possible. This is kind of difficult with cloud virtual, well, with cloud virtual machines, we, we do this. With cloud services, it's a bit tougher because they don't always offer this kind of thing, but it is something that we check on when we can. Um, but you know, we, we log access through system logs and so on. Um, and with that, I think I pass it over to Shane and he's going to continue on from control set five. Thanks, Mark. Um, let's see. I think I just requested control of the slide, so we'll see how that goes on the next slide. So um, control set five, security configurations for hardware. So this is all about the actual configuration of the assets themselves uh, and using something like a configuration management tool to not only you know, make sure that things are, are correct across the border, but to be able to de detect changes and um, any issues with, with those uh, con um, configurations on the asset. Um, so this is really only applied to the VMs uh, that we have uh, that provide internal services and functionality, um, but we use so few of them, um, we actually don't have a configuration management uh, system per se, something like Puppet or Ansible. Um, most of our assets are, are pretty much one-offs, so we make sure that we have things backed up appropriately, uh, not only um, images and snapshots, but also actual configuration data and um, back that up um, weekly uh, so, so that we have a way to easily restore um, configurations for those assets. There we go, the next slide here. There we go. Um, control set uh, control set six, maintenance, monitoring, and analysis of audit logs. Um, so the description is collect, manage, and analyze audit logs of events that could help detect, understand, or recover from attack. So obviously all about system logs and the infrastructure that's needed to support them. Um, so synchronized NTP, uh, actual system logging, making sure you have enough storage to store all of your logs, uh, log reporting, and um, for the IG3 actually implementing a seam. Um, again, this is only applied to the, the very few VMs that we have out in the cloud. Um, and an additional note there, again, much like the, the uh, configuration server, having a seam for, for us anyway, for a very few assets is a bit overkill, right? We'll end up having more machines or more VMs to monitor those three or four that we have than we actually need. So um, again, if seam is overkill, you can sort of, uh, use other types of controls to to mimic that behavior or at least give you an idea 
Um, so things like system reporting, log watch, where um, you know, there's a cron job on the host that goes through all of the system logs daily, weekly, whatever, categorizes them, and then sends out a report to you. Um, can also use other types of um, agents that, that are installed on the host, like OSSEC or OS Query, to give you some extra insight into uh, what the assets are actually doing. Control set seven, email and web browser protections. Uh, minimize the attack surface and opportunities for attackers to manipulate human behavior through their interaction with web browsers and email systems. Um, most of these are handled by institutions, um, specifically configurations of web browsers and email client, right? They, they sit on the our staff's computers, which we don't have any control or enforcement over. Um, however, this also does apply to uh, servers um, so we implement um, DMARC and SPF uh, and other things like that for email uh, sending. Um, and another note on here, uh, we, we mentioned our Google Drive policy before, uh, and this is another place where, you know, we really don't have any teeth to control things, but uh, putting it in the policy just to make, make sure people and staff are aware of it, as well as a little bit of training that comes with it, um, warning against using extensions or plugins that grant permission to G Drive. Um, the worst scenario, right, you're, you have maybe some type of extension that automatically mounts uh, your Google Drive folders to your laptop, your laptop gets hit with ransomware, and now you run the risk of potentially uh, that leaking into your Google Drive. So again, making sure you're aware of what extensions and plugins are installed and um, you know not using any that are not approved. Um, control set eight, malware defenses. <clears throat> control the installation, spread, and execution of malicious code at multiple points in the enterprise while optimizing the use of automation to ena enable rapid uh, updating of defense, data, data gathering, and corrective action. Um, this is another one where most are not applicable and handled by home institutions. Um, we do one of the higher level implementation group items is actually uh, implementing command line logging, aud audit logging of commands typed into uh, shell. Uh, so we implement that on the few VMs that we have that, that functionality in. Um, control set nine, uh, limitation in control of network ports, protocols, and services. Uh, so this is manage, track, control, correct the ongoing operational use of ports, protocols, and services on network device, devices in order to minimize windows of vulnerability at, available to attackers. Um, a lot of this deals with actual networking hardware, but um, also it can deal with machines or assets that provide services. Um, so again, applies to our cloud VMs. Uh, we, we implement both host-based uh, firewalls as well as firewalls implemented within the cloud service provider. Uh, disable un any un disable unneeded services and uh, using vulnerability scans for disco discovering and auditing open ports. Pretty standard stuff, um, uh, but again, sort of all about detection and, and prevention um, and making sure that things aren't running that don't need to be running and making sure that you notice when new things do come up on the network. Control set 10, data recovery capabilities. Um, the process and tools used to properly back up critical information with a proven methodology for timely recovery of it. So we have a couple different um, assets that are affected by this. Obviously, Google Drive, uh, that's manually backed up, stored encrypted offline, and restorations are tested. Um, cloud instances, uh, the actual VMs, if you will, images and snapshots are backed up daily. Um, through the cloud backup solution. We're not actually actively testing the backups, uh, but again, the, the number that we have in other um, controls that we have in place as far as backing up the data as well as the configs on there um, should be able, you should be able to, you know, restore um, the configuration in, in the asset uh, if there were an issue. Uh, and another th another one, um, the actual data and the content that is on the cloud instance or asset, 
Um, sometimes there's no easy built-in way through the provider, which seems kind of shocking to have a, a website or a, you know a website provider, a content provider that doesn't give you a way to back things up, but they're out there. So um, again, get get crafty using uh, other techniques such as like manual or you know through a cron job uh, mirroring techniques to just go out, scrape your website, and get all the data, and then put that through your backup program as as you would any other asset. Uh, control set 11, secure configurations for network devices. Um, this is all about networking gear, uh, routers, firewalls, uh, VPNs, that type of thing, um, and does not affect us. So it is not applicable across the board for us. Boundary defense, uh, detect, prevent, correct the flow of information transferring networks of different trust levels with a focus on security damaging data. Uh, again, being sort of uh, remote all of the, all of our different institutions we really don't have borders per se or at least borders that we can control so we mark this as na uh, handled by institutions um there are some uh controls in this group that could potentially be applied to assets that that run services um but they're pretty uh high level and uh take a lot of resources so like dns filtering and other types of of things like that that you would have to actually run on the end node um and again sometimes it, adding those extra controls are, are sort of more work than more work than it's worth um so again it, um it's 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 good to know that it's good to mention that in your control tracker uh, you know, we're not doing this, but we accept the risk and these are the additional or extra controls that we're using to, you know, give us a little extra coverage on that. Uh, control set 13, data protection. The processes and tools used to prevent data exfiltration, mitigate the effects of exfiltrated data, and ensure the privacy and integrity of sensitive information. Uh, about half of these are not applicable because uh, we're unable to enforce uh, things like, you know, DLP or other issues like or other software like that on staff computers. Uh, but we do apply it to uh, our Google Drive um, and we use our ASAPs documentations to um, basically uh, track and and document all of our sensitive data uh, assets. Um, so again, using encrypted offline backups for G Drive. Um, and another one that's in there that um, is, is interesting and um, difficult, again, to do, uh, a policy to address expired sensitive data. Um, we, we've worked with a lot of groups over the years, and um, I'm sure a lot of you are aware and know that once you start using Google, it can be very easy to sort of forget how much data you create and where it is and what's in it and things like that. So number one, being able to find that sensitive data is one thing. Number two, having some way to time it out or a policy that says, you know, after five years, if it's no longer needed, it should be destroyed. Um, so having a policy to sort of state those guidelines in, in you know, what, what to do in that case is, is, is very helpful. And an additional note, and I probably should have made a bullet point on this, but we do have a document labeling policy that we apply to our Google data or our G Drive data that outlines how not, not only top level, level folders, but also documents are labeled that, that sh sort of show their sharing and what type of information is in them, um, both in the document and in the file and in, in directory names. Um, so that that's... Uh, in, a possible way that you could at least label the data. So then, you know, whenever you're trying to search for it or expire, you can look at dates, you could look at, you know, the classification of the data. Is it public? Is it restricted, et cetera, et cetera. Um, CS14. Controlled access based on the need to know. <clears throat> so the processes and tools used to track, control, prevent, correct, secure access to critical assets, information, resources, or systems. According to the formal determination of which persons, computers, and applications have a need and right to access these critical assets based on an approved classification. 
Uh, so we're again stuck halfway between NA uh, and some being applicable. Um, so network segmentation, anything that deals with hardware or actual devices, we, we can't really do a whole lot with. So network segmentation, firewalling, zero trust, DLP on uh, staff laptops are non-enforceable. Uh, the others that do apply, uh, Google Drive, Slack, mailing lists, other types of things like that. Um, and this is where we sort of, again, use our ASAPs documents. Um, so we know which people have what rights for which asset. And, you know, during the onboarding and offboarding processes, we, we look at those and update them accordingly. Um, and as, as alluded to in a previous slide, um, working on a way to scan for and identify sensitive information, um, right? If, if it's sensitive and you don't need it, um, why run the risk of it being discovered or leaking or something like that? Um, so, Again, appropriately, appropriately, appropriately labeling things and uh, being having a way to like enforce data timeouts is is key here. Uh, CS fifteen wireless access control. Uh, again, this is all hardware and physical device stuff that we don't have any uh, control over. So NA on this one. CS sixteen account monitoring and control. Accurately manage the life cycle of system application accounts, their creation, use dormancy, deletion in order to minimize opportunities for attackers to leverage them. So this affects uh, cloud and remote services and resources. Uh, we have ASAPs documents for each asset, uh, enable MFA wherever possible um, and uh, leverage other external things. So one, one nice thing is uh, most of us are, are housed at uh, universities that participate in CI logon. So we were able to sort of leverage and in, in, uh, use CI logon for authentication in a couple of places, which, you know, lessens the, the need for someone to be a subject matter expert on that in our end, as far as like running a Kerberos database or anything like that. Um, so sort of farming out your auth. Uh, CS17, implement a security awareness and training program. Uh, for all functional roles in the organization, prioritizing those mission critical to the business and its security, identify the specific knowledge, skills, and abilities needed to support defense of the enterprise, develop and execute an integrated plan to assess, identify gaps, and remediate through policy, organizational planning, training, and awareness programs. Um, most of the official training sort of is done through home institutions. Um, specific training uh, and review uh, on, on trusted CI policies is done by all staff. Um, anytime we have a new policy that comes into play, um, staff are required to read it and, you know, um, follow uh, the, what's in the policy. Um, document labeling policy um, is another, again, I mentioned previously, another way that you can uh, get in extra information inside that document, classification, data timeouts, things like that. Uh, and then plugging our summit, um, you know, there's a lot of really great knowledge that comes through there. A lot of us attend that. So um, sort of ancillary training, if you will, through, through uh, the summit. CS18 application software security. Uh, so this is for in-house developed software. Um, we really only have one asset that falls under that category, which is Cloud Perm, um, and our developers have secure coding experience. Um, and there's another plug there for Software Assurance, which has a bunch of training guides there and other types of uh, documents uh, based on uh, secure coding and, and software assurance. Uh, CS19, Incident Response and Management. Um, so basically, this is having an IR policy. Um, Linked there is the template to the one that we use here, Trusted CI. Uh, so the big things in the Trusted CI, or I'm sorry, in, in an IR policy, uh, who, who is responsible for what, uh, what roles they, they play in if there is an incident, um, and extra things sort of like uh, communications channels. Basically, you want to have sort of like 
all your gotchas laid out in your IR policy, right? If our mail server is compromised, we can no longer uh, communicate with each other through our mail. So what, what's a fallback or another out of band type of way to communicate with people? Listing all your you know, cell phone numbers, uh, having basically everything in that document that you need um, if, if things go south. Um, and another interesting one that we've seen, uh, and it's kind of nice, is actually having sort of uh, a playbook or a, a scenario based, uh, okay, if, if our auth server gets compromised, this is what we're going to do. If our website gets compromised, this is what we're going to do sort of a playbook for each different type of uh, incident scenario. Um, and those can actually be tying into number two here, conduct, conduct tabletop exercises. Um, so when you're conducting the episode, you're sort of trying to think ahead what could happen. It's a great place to put into your IR policy after you've actually gone through that exercise. Um, also, ISO team members are members of InfraGuard, the FBI's InfraGuard, Ren Isaac, and other in intelligence sharing communities. And CS20 penetration tests and red team exercises. Uh, test the overall strength in, of an organization's defense, the technology, the processes, and the people by simulating the objectives and actions of an actions of an attacker. Uh, most in this are NA. Again, we, we sort of have such a small footprint of assets that we actually manage, like our our cloud VMs. That doing this full fledged, it might be a little bit of overkill, but we we do try to use additional scanning techniques. Uh, so using web application scanners. Um, we subscribe to UT Austin's Dorkbot program, um, and again, using our credentialed vulnerability scans. Um, and maybe one more. Yep. Uh, so this is my last slide, uh, CIS tools. So just a couple of links of different types of tools that you can use for dealing with the CIS controls. Um, two official ones, these, are, these come from CIS 7.1 and then 8. Um, the trusted CIS tracker, as Mark mentioned before, uh, available on our framework tools and templates page, has additional columns for relevance, status assessment, and uh, notes that you can take based on each, each uh, subcontrol. Um, and another thing to mention too, so the, the controls are, they're, they're sort of vague, they're sort of um, not prescriptive uh, in that they tell you exactly what to do. It's like you should enable MFA, right? It's different across all systems. So CIS also has benchmarks and these are actual configuration guidelines that you can use to harden systems. So for Linux, for you know routers, things like that. Um, and they tie into the CIS control set. Um, so that that's that's worth looking at, um, you know, a actionable things, actual pieces of configuration that you can put onto your 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 assets to configure them securely. Uh, and this one we just found recently. I'm not sure how long it's been around, but CIS actually has an online um, tool, and if you register and become a member, you can get a self-hosted option. Uh, control self-assessment. Control self-assessment tools. CSAT. So basically. Um, you can have a team of people, you go through each, each uh, sub-control, you can say whether it's applicable or not. Um, if the control is automated, if the control has been reported, who is assigned to, all kinds of extra di different metadata that you can use to sort of track where you are assessing against uh, CIS-8. Uh, and they give you pretty little graphs and other kinds of neat things like that. So um, definitely worth checking out. And with that, I believe I will pass it back to Mark or Jeanette. Well, I, I think we're done with the main uh, presentation. So I will have people um, type questions as they um, come up with them. But we do have some community updates to announce. So if you could jump to the front of the presentation, that'd be great. Thank you. Awesome. So our next webinar is Monday, September 26th at 11 a.m. Eastern. Our topic is Regulated Research Communities of Practice. Our presenters are Carolyn Ellis and Eric uh, Dumans. Um, there's also some events coming up that if you haven't already um, registered for them or if you haven't seen them yet, we want to let you know. Um, the NSF Research Infrastructure Workshop is 
going to be held September 13th through 16th in Boulder. This is a hybrid event, but if you're attending in person, come find um, me, Jim, Mark, uh, anyone from Trusted CI and say hello. Uh, you can find more about that at researchinfrastructureoutreach.com slash workshop. And then um, also Trusted CI has its cybersecurity summit. It will also be a, a hybrid event. Um, some of us will be in person. Um, that's October 18th through 20th through the 20th in Bloomington, Indiana. And to learn more about that, you can go to trustedci.org slash 2022 cybersecurity summit. I'm actually gonna throw that link in the chat. Um, but while I'm um, pulling up these links, we have a we had one question um, and there's some kind of a follow-up. So I'll, I'll read through the whole thing and then we can discuss. Uh, does Trusted CI have a recommended approach to control um, the software assets for a project that critically relies on custom software? Um, and um, Jim Basney commented in the in the question uh, or in the in the chat to uh, look up the Trusted CI Guide to Securing Scientific Software, um, which is a, a a document that we've published um, on our website. And the person says. Um, skimming that doc makes me think it's more focused on uh, CS18 concerns. My question, though, is everything else around the custom software, for example, controls on what software is permitted to execute, privileges needed across development, test, production environments, that sort of thing. Right. So thanks for the question. Um, so I'm not, I'm not a Windows expert, but... Uh, I know that one way that you can control it on uh, Windows is to have like group policy and uh, application whitelisting. Um, on other systems, you you know you could have uh, like if you have an application under Linux um, that you don't want people to run, you could restrict it through groups and then maybe uh, use sudo to uh, the sudo program, which is normally used for accessing root to allow you to access that program if you authenticate or if you're in a certain group or something. Um, so, I mean, you can do that with, with uh, group permissions on the, the application. Um, if you're talking, I think the question came up while I was talking about software asset management. And if you're talking about just seeing what applications are out there on the network uh, or on systems, I mean, you could do scans of people's systems Another option is to run a, a network uh, monitoring system like Zeek uh, that can look at the system and actually will automatically keep an inventory of what software is out there uh, based on its IP address and, and so on. So th that's a few options. I'm not sure where that really addresses your question. Um, let me know if you have follow up questions <laughs> to that. Um, do we have any? Any, um, oh, they say oh, that, that that'll do, great. Um, any other questions from the audience um, for Shane or Mark? Um, uh, one thing that I wanted to talk about while we were preparing for this webinar is the um, ASAPS document, the ASAPS document. Um, uh, as Mark explained, uh, we have these assets that we try to track and manage and make sure that um, the right people have access to them, and so uh, Mark and and the rest of the security team, when they when they learn of a new a new asset that we're adding to the Trusted CI project, uh, they send out this document, and they have whoever is kind of like the first like line of of or the first user of the document um, kind of fill it out. And so um, I had the privilege of filling out the Zoom document and the. Um, I think it was the uh, the Apple podcast document. Um, so each of those things require a login and uh, you know how do you how do you control who's that having access to it? Um, so the reason why I'm, I'm bringing this up is because if you those of you in the audience, if you're interested in in enforcing some of these security policies and 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 getting people to buy into what it is that you're trying to accomplish, this AS. APS document, the SASAPS document was not too difficult. Uh, it wasn't too burdensome for me as a non-security professional to complete. Um, and and I I, uh, I liked being part of the security policy. I like I like them caring that I'm having access to these things, um, and and wanting to be good stewards of it. 
Yeah, thanks, Jeanette. That's a great point. Yeah, you might be surprised that uh, we actually have an ASAPS document for this very Zoom uh, account that we're using right now to run this webinar. Um, and if, if you are familiar with the framework, you'll know that um, must eight of the framework is all about comprehensive application. And this is something that I have like a stick that I, you know, I beat people with. I, I say like, you have to make sure that you think about all the different um, aspects that you, you know, information assets that you have, including cloud applications, including social media, including video conferencing and stuff like that. So Zoom itself has uh, an ASAPS document. It's an asset that we need to keep track of. Um, so think about all of your assets, not just those that have an IP address or, you know, that, that are on your network or, um, or PCs or whatever. Any, any follow-up questions or uh, any other questions from the audience before we wrap things up? Oh, here we got one. Um, any suggestion or plan to address spear phishing attacks that spoof an Amazon system administrator, um, that's an example, deceiving the victim and convincing them to purchase and uh, forfeit gift cards? Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> so, I mean, with... Um... With phishing, I think the, the most important thing to do to address phishing is training. You know, having a, a training program, and you might have, uh, you might remember we talked about training and how some of that is stuff that's handled by the institution. Phishing is actually one of those that we actually have checked with the institutions that make up Trusted CI to make sure that there's some kind of phishing training. Um, because, you know, that a lot of people, they think I'm not going to, uh, fall victim to a phishing attack. Um, but the thing is, is that they're always trying to catch you in the right moment, right? And they're always trying to catch you when you're in a panic situation. One of the one of the craziest examples I, I have for a phishing attack is where um, a high level executive at a company was being profiled by the attackers and they even knew where his son went to school. And so when there was a bomb threat that was called into that school, they actually had a custom work document ready to go that had a macro in it to infect the, the victim that they sent off to uh, the victim and said, hi, this is your son's school. Please uh, click on the attachment to uh, find out information about the bomb threat that just happened. And I feel like, boy, that's really unfair almost. But of course the attackers, they don't care. They, they play dirty. And so, Training can help you to um, um, address this issue of habit of clicking on things and trying to make you think twice and even realize that sometimes the craziest situations can just be an attack vector for getting in and infecting you with malware. Um, so I think phishing training is, is important. Um, I also think it's good for people to understand a little bit more about uh, how to read the headers and maybe uh, you know, how to understand how the, the headers work and email addresses, and also just, you know, um, making sure that whenever anybody is asking you for to give credentials or something like that, that you're just taking a second to step back and, and kind of diffuse the situation. Uh, there's a really great book called Fishing Dark Waters that talks about the hijacking the amygdala, which is the part of your brain that deals with um, panic situations like, you know, uh, when somebody is being attacked or, or some emergency comes up and stuff like that. Uh, and that talks about how these, these phishing attacks work based on that principle. It's not really based on your technical knowledge. It's just based on tricking the brain. Uh, We've got a couple more questions in here. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Could you talk a bit more about how you made the determinations of whether Trusted CI's controls implementations were satisfactory or not satisfactory? Shane, did you want to take one? I can give it a shot. Um, so that's actually pretty tricky. Uh, lots of discussion, honestly. Um, you know, really trying to, a lot of times these controls are not worded the best way. Um, and as we went through the tracker, um, we, we sort of documented any types of like sort of wording issues or coverage issues between what the control was saying, what we thought it was, and possibly how it applied to the asset we were talking about. Um, but really, when it came down to it, it was it was a lot of discussion between the four of us on the ISO group, um, potentially thinking about 
how could this asset, depending upon what control it was, how 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 could this asset be compromised? If it is compromised, what is the risk? So sort of doing like a, a risk assessment then of, of the asset that we're in question. And is it, um, you know, how, how do we rate that? Is, is, is it the end of the world? Is it a critical asset uh, that it would then be not satisfactory or, you know, could we apply some type of other control? But uh, I guess, again, going back to just, just a lot of sort of discussion and then sort of doing a risk assessment of, of that control on, on the asset that we were talking about. Anything you'd like to add, Mark? No, I think you covered it pretty well. And then the next one, uh, as you use the CIS controls, are you also mapping to NIST 800-171 controls for federal controlled unclassified info CUI data, or perhaps CUI not applicable? Um, so for this round, we did not, we pretty much just used the CIS controls. Um, I don't know that we have any CUI, well, we haven't yet. Um, whenever we reevaluate against eight, um, we may look into that. Um, again, as we mentioned before, uh, one, of the, one of the things that we wanted to work on was uh, scanning for sensitive data as well as you know, having a policy or something to time that out. So I could see both of those sort of activities you know, rolling into one, and then maybe we do go down the, you know, at least the CUI data um, plan. I don't know that we would go NIST. Um, sometimes too many control frameworks can be a little bit much, um, but um, yeah, that's, that's where we're at. Thank you. Okay, last yeah. call for, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, yeah, Craig is saying, yeah, we don't have CUI. <laughs> um, last call for questions, and we had this uh, additional comment. I think this is going back to the phishing issue that Microsoft o Outlook hides headers by default. <laughs> I wonder if that's going to be going away, uh, or if they're going to be reverting to some other, um, you know, view so to let people know, like, oh, this maybe isn't coming from who you think it's coming from. <laughs> you know, it's being spoofed effectively. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, it's, it, it's kind of funny. It's like this cat and mouse game of, of phishing training, try to raise the bar for how much they teach you about how email works. And a, a long time ago, I was like, I was an advocate for teaching people exactly how the email protocol works and how the, you know, the headers work and stuff. But maybe that was too high of a bar for, uh, for people. But, you know, it's like, we're eventually getting to that point where it's like, well, you need to read the email headers. <laughs> yeah, before you click on anything. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, well, I, I think we're going to wrap things up. I uh, thank you so much, uh, Mark and Shane for agreeing to present. And thank you, those of, the, of you in the audience who had questions. I will be um, uploading a, a, a copy of this video later today. So if you want to share this with your colleagues, uh, please go and do that. I'll be announcing it on the announcements uh, mailing list. And with that, um, thank you everyone for presenting. Uh, any last comments from Mark or Shane? Thank you everybody for joining in your questions. Yep, thank you. Bye. All right, bye everybody. When I, when I end this meeting, uh, you'll leave the room. So have a great day. Bye. Bye.